Race Break it down. only comes out <laughs> Break it down. for other people. We've always been black. We don't think about it. It just is. Now, do I think it's racist? No, I just think you're ignorant. Whoopi Goldberg's voice quivers in the face of a relentless onslaught, her panic palpable as she grapples with the ferocity of Rosie O'Donnell's verbal barrage. So, you guys, today we got The View host blasts Whoopi Goldberg live for destroying the show. Now, Whoopi goes off on the whole co-host <laughs> group. <laughs> Bro, I have no idea exactly why she's going off. That's why we're here, right? Race it only comes out <laughs> Break it down for other people. We've always been black. We don't think about it. It just is. First of all, Whoopi Goldberg, how is she still on the air after all of this? Like, I, I'm in shock. I can't even talk because I don't even know. Like, this is wild. Like, you constantly keep disrespecting people and disrespecting artists, politicians, history. We all know that song wasn't racist. I know it's a lot of black people who didn't find an uh, issue with that song. My whole problem with this situation is that how people can say things or, or feel free to say certain things or label someone as something and there be like no type of consequences. Her gaze wavers, a shield against the blistering verbal assault that leaves her visibly shaken and vulnerable. Her words morph into a plea for reprieve. You know, is it racist? Do you think it's racism? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, and it's just crazy. You don't think I it's racist been... if somebody turns to the leader of the free country and says, can you park my car? What, but the difference is, I go into Brooks Brothers. My mother will go into when it used to go into a place, and they would follow her around. Now, do I think it's racist? No, I just think you're ignorant. You think everybody that walks in, you think if they don't look like they have a lot of money? We just saw recently that two white people would look very rich. A desperate attempt to weather the storm of O'Donnell's relentless critique. As the nation listens, Goldberg's voice becomes a testament to the unyielding pressure of public discourse and the toll it exacts on even the most seasoned voices. So at the beginning, I was kind of like, you know, on not nobody's side. I don't take sides. But that's one reason why I don't like to talk politics on my channel because it can, it can very well go left real quick. Depends on how I may feel about the situation, how the other person may feel, you guys may feel. But in this scenario, bro, at the beginning, I was like, well, you know the show is about controversial topics, right? Then, when it came down to the Holocaust thing and the comments that she made on that, nah, that's that's when she she struck a nerve with me, real. I think she, she should be held accountable for her actions and her comments, bro. Even though she apologized, that was uncalled for, bro. That was very, very uncalled for. And, and seeing some of these highlights when she's making these uh, these comments on certain topics and the way she storms off the set is showing that she's not having control over her emotions of what she's saying, whether she's right or wrong. There's a there's a very fine line on certain topics, you know, that you talk about, especially when it comes down to race, ethnic background, uh, so on and so forth. You know? So that was that was uncalled for. Um, it's shocking to me. It's, it, it's, it's shocking. Um, I know the show is based off, you know, the intake of of, of a person's opinion. But uh, wow, man, I, I didn't see this really coming from Whoopi. Within her tumultuous dialogue emerges a mosaic of conflict, inviting viewers to contemplate the fragile balance between assertion and vulnerability. Listen, man, this lady has been through it all in the sense of all the types of controversies and has not been canceled. Why do you guys think that is? How do you not get canceled after saying all these things about Kyle Rittenhouse, after saying all these things about Jason Aldean? How do you get on national television and bash people? Like, 
How 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 do you like? How does that even make sense? In this in this great nation, we always look. You are you are you are innocent until proven guilty, but only to the people that you like. So she said that for Bill Cosby. When it comes down to Donald Trump, or when it comes down to Kyle Rittenhouse, they're guilty until proven innocent. That's usually how they've been doing it this whole time. But she's just a hypocrite. She's some. She's just. It's just tasteless. And all the stuff that she said, I don't even know how this lady has a job. Like, for real, I, I don't get it. And at the end of the day, you know, God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. I hope that Jason Aldean launches this lawsuit. I hope that Kyle Rittenhouse too, man. Like, what's up with these lawsuits? Let's make it happen, man. The spotlight sharpens on Goldberg, an emblem of a public figure under fire, unafraid to confront the tempest of public scrutiny head on. No, but on a serious note, you know, we've been following the Jason Aldean story since the beginning uh, in terms of when the music video broke and the world <laughs> got real weird. Whoopi Goldberg put herself in a direct crossfire of that by just alleging that the song was, he was racist and the song was racist. And, and when she was critiquing the song at the time, she hadn't even heard it. She was just reading the lyrics. I'm curious to hear what Tom Selleck has to say to what because we know what's been going on at the view for a long time they just they need racism to to survive in this dramatic moment whoopi goldberg stands as a symbol of resilience urging society to reflect on the impact of intense criticism on public figures and their capacity to weather the storm you know this thing is gonna blow over but like the effect that it has on jason aldean calling him a racist and for people who don't do no research or investigate reasons why, they're just gonna roll with people, you know? But like I said, that show seems to do a lot of stuff. It should be called, I don't know if everybody, anybody ever said this, I'm pretty sure, but it should be called The Views, you know what I mean? Cause that's what they're trying to do is get the views. But we all know um, a lot of times people, you know, it's about the ratings and all that. But just to be willing to take that over, um, you know, trying to just label, like labeling someone as a racist for views, that that's just crazy. Just crazy. I don't know, man. I, I, I really hope he sue. I hope he win. Um, but at the end of the day, like, it's like these people got so much money, it don't even matter. Right? Like, it don't even matter. Their money is going to outlive them. Turn on the television, girl. Where are you going? Where are you going? I'm leaving you. And put a finger in my face and yelled, I've done more for victims than you ever will. Whoopi Goldberg's voice trembles with urgency as she pleads for mercy. A poignant cry that reverberates with raw vulnerability. Here are the ladies on The View going on and on about exactly that issue being let off by Whoopi Goldberg, who, by the way, may not have a job anymore because, don't forget, ABC is owned by Disney. Disney CEO Bob Iger says he wants to get rid of ABC and those legacy TV businesses, so you may not have to watch her for long. That will be the good news. Turn on the television, girl. Where are you going? Where are you going? I'm leaving y'all. <laughs> We got Whoopi Goldberg begs for mercy as Tom Selleck destroys her. Now, we know that Whoopi been in the news due to her remarks about Jason Aldean and his song and stuff like that. Y'all remember what I said. I told her she should at least watch the video, listen to the song instead of just reading off a sheet and listening uh, and listening to what other people are saying. Her gaze is a window into her soul, revealing a desperation for redemption that captivates hearts and demands empathy and put a finger in my face and yelled, I've done more for victims than you ever will. Then I said to her some few choice words I cannot repeat. Like, people will hit you with this stuff talking about, well, we got free speech to say anything we want, but yes, but I mean, not calling somebody the R word. We ain't finna consider that being free. Like, you can't just go around doing it. Oh, his song is the R word. The view is off the air, finally. Whoopi has to rest her ginormous mouth in bad attitude. 
her words transform into a heartfelt plea, a resounding request for a chance at forgiveness that tugs at the strings of compassion. Like, if, if anybody listened to that song, watched that video, I mean, anybody would tell you that that song was not racist at all. I don't see, like, I'm still sitting up here thinking, like, how is they calling this song racist? How? He didn't mention anything. It, the videos he was showing is videos that's already out on YouTube. He just put them in a video. Them, them clips are already out on YouTube. It's like, I, I really don't get it. And like I said, I was just highly upset. Like I said, I like the Whoopi Goldberg like as the movie actor, but on the view, the way like uh, a lot of y'all that I was saying, saying in the comment section, the way she be treating her guests, and like I will always bring up the way she treated Judge Janine, cussing her out, telling her to get out the show, don't come back. Then we later find out that the view has been taken off air. Like I said, I had no idea about that. But, I mean, if you look at some of the stuff that she's been doing and some of the stuff that she's been saying, it, it's crazy. Because anytime I will, like, look at that show, every time Whoopi Goldberg says that, every time she says something, the whole, it's like the crowd just feeds back. Like, I don't know if they just on her side, but every time she says something, the whole, <laughs> the whole building just clapping. But when she made that remark about Jason Aldean, it wasn't a lot of clapping up in that building. Like, come on, man. You just can't be saying anything about somebody and calling them that. As the world listens, Goldberg's voice becomes a powerful testament to the human capacity for humility and the yearning for a second chance. Which is that The View is taking a pause as of August 4th. What's the cause of their interruption? Well, the Writers Guild, you know, there was a big strike regarding the writers. And this affected The View a little tiny bit. That is... Any guests that they brought in, they weren't allowed to talk about their projects that were at all uh, tied to the Writers Guild. So they were able to pump their books and stuff like that, but it ended up affecting the quality of The View. The View uh, started losing ratings and fans started complaining that without the good material for them to talk about on their show, the ladies, the hosts, argued with each other all the time. Within her earnest dialogue unfolds a mosaic of remorse, inviting viewers to reflect on the complexities of seeking redemption in the public eye. That's the thing, man. You just can't be, I mean, then you got to look at it. You are on TV. You can't get on TV just bashing people, saying mean things and don't think it's going to be consequences. It's going to be consequences for making those type of remarks. Like I said about the Jewish people and, and you know, these remark about Jason Aldean, what you did to a lot of the guests that came on uh, came on the show. Like you just can't treat people uh, any way you want to treat them just because you're the host of the show. It don't work that way. You still got to treat people with respect. You just can't be calling them something. And like that's what made me really highly, uh, highly upset about Whoopi like not like listening to the song, not watching the video. She, she got on there, they said this, they said this is what the song uh, was about. And I was like, come on. Sometimes you got to take time out for yourself and watch videos or whatever the case may be for yourself so you can get your own percept, uh, perspective about it instead of just running off. Because, of course, everybody else on the show was trying to dog Jason Aldean, calling their song racist and stuff like that. Come on, man. The spotlight narrows on Goldberg, a symbol of human frailty unafraid to bear her soul and seek forgiveness openly. So, however, while this break happens before they go into the next season, which uh, supposedly is to start in September, um, this is when shows usually can their hosts, like they can certain members, and there's no announcement yet on which crew members are under contract or will renew their contract to come back for a new season. This is when they cut hosts and bring in new talent or even cut the show. Disney, remember, has talked about having these legacy shows where they might either cut them or sell them because ABC and uh, Disney product has been cratering because of the explosion of the internet and even you know cable is starting to fail now. In this poignant juncture, Whoopi Goldberg stands as an embodiment of vulnerability prompting society to contemplate the power of mercy and the pursuit of redemption. 
And like some of these remarks, I didn't even know Whoopi made some of these remarks back in 2015. And she uh, uh, been through three marriages, divorced three times. Like, I'm not even going to dig into that right there. But just the way that she acts on TV, like with this TV show, is just beyond me. Like, oh, my God, bro. Like, I'm telling y'all, I had no idea about this view show. I didn't know she treated people like that until I watched the video where she had the judge on that judge's knee. And when I listened to what a lot of y'all was saying in the comment section, say, yo, Adol, she been doing it to a lot of guests that comes on there because, you know, she don't like Donald Trump. So if you are Donald Trump supporter and you come on this show, she just going to try to treat you a certain type of way just because. And then we all know that Judge Janine supports Donald Trump and we know Whippy don't. So that was her frustration about that. Then you turn around, like I said, you did this in 2015, and then you just recently did this to Jason Aldean. Like, come on, man. You, yeah, she has a, it's like she has a track record of just messing with people, just feeling like she can just say anything she want, man. And like I said, I like the Whoopi Goldberg as the actor, like movie acting, but on this TV show, she's on another level. Like, she, uh, <laughs> it's crazy. So there was a huge illuminated triple six, six in red. Yeah. And I went from that to that to that. No matter how strong you are, you are going to be affected by this place. Mm -hmm. In a shocking revelation, Mel Gibson's voice pierces through the glamour of Hollywood, exposing a sinister agenda that has remained veiled for too long. When I came over here, I was, oh God, I was in my, my uh, mid-twenties. Right. The first time I really came over here. You know, I had a whole bunch of weird paranoid suspicions about what the hell was going on because there was a lot of stuff I couldn't understand. Right. Um, and nobody was really bothering to explain it to me. And I formed a bunch of opinions about the town and about the people in it that were like, Surely that couldn't be, because a whole place can't be like, you know, weird town, you know, where the stranger wanders in and, and all the people are in the bar and they all shut up when he looks at him. And, mm -hmm. and then you go away and you think, no, that's, I was wrong. I mean, that's insane thinking. I'm paranoid. I imagined that stuff. That couldn't be the reason for why so-and-so was acting like Put it, mm. and then you find out later on the track that you are exactly on track mm. with a lot of this stuff. Not specifically on no. track. With unwavering conviction, he delves into the underbelly of the entertainment industry, daring to uncover the hidden motives and manipulations. Uh, that some of your worst nightmares were real at the time, and you think, <gasps> mm. now this is what I mean by actually starting to swim up or downstream with the rest of the salmon, mm. you know, eventually, if you stay here long enough. Yeah. You'll find yourself doing that. A place like this can humiliate you. Mm -hmm. And it can be, it can either, it can humiliate you, it can be humbling. I mean, it, it does rip your life to pieces mm -hmm. if you'll let it. Yeah. And it's always pounding at the walls. It's yeah. like these little guys these little heathens with no soul downstairs with horns on their head with a battering ram trying to like beat your walls in. Yeah. But that's your own devils, you know? Yeah. Amidst the dazzle of fame, his piercing insights cast a spotlight on the pervasive darkness that taints the illusion of Hollywood's facade. Well, it seems like you're doing something terribly wrong. You feel like some mm -hmm. kind of a, you know, I mean, you feel as if you're, you're committing a, yeah. it's, it's kind of slimy. It's, it's kind of prostitution. Sure. And and it and and it, but that I think is even beyond. It's it's just kind of watching someone uh, go through the act of prostituting themselves. Mm. It's kind of, it, it it's there's something very un, almost unbearable about it, and it kind of frightened me. Mm. Um, and he's a very smart guy, mm. and we started talking, and I didn't you know say much of anything about reading the script, nothing. I just started talking about the Middle Ages and, mm. and he um, and he began to talk tortures. And we swapped tortures because I'd read this book on torture mm. and and I I tried to recall some of the most heinous things I'd ever read in this book and, 
And he was like, oh, oh, and he'd try and top it. <laughs> and it, it got, and my assistant was there and he left because he, he couldn't stand it anymore. Yeah. The, the air had turned cold. Mm -hmm. And then he left and I, I wanted to leave. <laughs> and because I knew that I didn't want to work with him. Yeah. And he was getting scary. Yeah. And then I turned around and it was on top of the Peninsula Hotel. I turned around to avoid his steady gaze at one point. Yeah. And I was looking at a building with the top of the sixes on it. So there was a huge illuminated triple six, six in red. Yeah. And I went from that to that to that. And he, he started smiling. Yeah. And I thought, oh no, Chris Walken is the Antichrist, yeah. you know? In the shadows of illusion, he stands as a vigilant revealer of truth, imploring us to question the messages propagated by the industry. Well, it's not fair on them either. No. It's, it's, it's asking them to do something. And you don't find out anything you from it. Nothing. You find out nothing from it. This is the main reason why I really hate it. Uh, you can get them in there and somebody might do just a slap up job for that day, but that's what they've aimed at. That mm -hmm. day, they, you're not, you have to be able to figure out whether they're gonna be any good for three months while you're working with them. Mm. And, and the best way to do that is to get them in the room, sit them down, um, and it may be uncomfortable, as it always is getting to know someone to begin with, and they think they're gonna have to read, so you tell them, well, to begin with, I don't want you to read anything, and they, and they sort of relax a little. Mm -hmm. And you say, and I don't, I, I'm not making anybody read, so they don't feel like they're being outcast. Rock. No, that's the big thing, yeah. And uh, and I don't think it tells you anything except the fact that, well, hey, they can read. But the scary thing is that I think a lot of people think that. Mm. Maybe not to that extreme. Mm. <clears throat> there are people, well-meaning people, that, and you find that the woman and the woman's role in a film becomes some sort of just appendage to the man. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I can, I can see why they're not too fulfilled in, in, in doing that. Each word he imparts carries the weight of an industry grappling with its own hidden agenda and the impact it has on society. It is. Yeah. The system is completely based on money. Yeah. Uh, the studio system. Yeah. Uh, to a degree, I think the way I hook into the system is based on money. I mean, uh, we're pretty prolific for a perceived vanity company. Right. which uh, I think a lot of people start film companies and then they sure. they don't really do anything with them. But this is <clears throat> gets into the act sometimes, not always successfully either. Yeah. I mean, we've made some t some horrible little pictures, but we've made some good ones too. Yeah. And um, so that that's, there's a pride in that and I enjoy doing that. Yeah, and how I'm active are you? Pretty active. You've got a good team, haven't you? Yeah, I think yeah. The, the, there's a lot of people here with with good heads on their shoulders, yeah. um, and nobody's immune from making a mistake. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we make plenty of them. We call them school fees. Do you? School fees. Every time we get ripped off, or yeah, um, or make a big mistake, or you know where it's and it costs you. Yeah. And you think, oh, it costs you two million or four million. Gibson embodies the collective desire for transparency, giving voice to those who yearn to understand the true motivations driving Hollywood's narratives. No, it's not solely financially based. Mm. Um, I think that there's an art in marrying the two. Sure, yeah. And, and uh, if you can find that balance and satisfy both requirements, then you are successful within the industry. Right. It doesn't mean you're not successful yeah. if you don't meet one of those requirements. You're just successful within this industry. Uh, the social contract. You can't get mad. Mm -hmm. You can't get mad. You can't let it get you. Because you have to have, you have to make a deal with everyone else and it's almost unspoken that you are going to be f over at some point by people who you may have done something nice for. Mm. And it may happen that by circumstance, or even very purposefully, that you've someone over. But that shouldn't get in the way of you being able to sit down and have fun with them. <laughs> you, am I on the right track? Absolutely. You, you can't build a resentment about it. Mm. You have to still 
try and love those people. Yeah. Because that's the way they're thinking. Because it ain't personal. No, it's not personal. They don't really mean to hurt you. No. Not really. I don't quite understand. Well, I mean, there's a lot of motivations for why it sure. happens. Yes, many. <laughs> you have to choose what level of integrity you're coming in at. And... Okay. Uh, and I've often felt it. I've sat there and I have felt the knife slipped firmly in between my shoulder blades and tried to have it shoved through the other side through my heart. And I've actually felt the whole thing and I've gone, ah! Mm. Or, wait till next week, you know? Or, and you'll resent it for a little while mm. and you have to let it go. Otherwise you'll, you'll eat yourself alive here. Mm. And I think it takes that kind of cockroach resilience to survive in this town. I mean, this is a bizarre place. Um, and it doesn't take very long if, if, and I'm sure you've experienced this if you've stayed here for any length of time. You come in, you're fresh from the outside. You're off the boat from the farm, still got shit on your shoes. You're in here. People are charmed by that, mm. that you've still got shit on your shoes. Uh, they're charmed by the fresh approach you bring to it. And that's a real thing. Mm -hmm. But they're also stroking the shit out of you, you know, mm -hmm. licking you all over. And that's kind of good for you, too. That's great. But it doesn't take very long before you realize, or before it gets to you, it's cascading on you all the time. You can't get away from certain attitudes, from certain modes of behavior that this town and the industry dictate. And no matter how strong you are, when you come in off the farm mm. with those convictions and those and a certain line of attack, no matter how strong you are, you are going to be affected by this place. Mm. No, I've, it's I've... going to divert you from where you were going. Sure. You're going to be diverted. Mm. One of the most disturbing problems in our world today is human trafficking, and particularly the trafficking of children. Now, the first step in eradicating this crime is awareness. In the constellation of modern influence, certain stars shine brighter than the rest. Among these luminaries, Elon Musk and Mel Gibson are celestial bodies that have left indelible marks in their respective galaxies of technology and cinema. Both have blazed trails, defied conventions, and shaped the contours of our collective dreams. Yet the world was unprepared for the cosmic alignment that saw these two giants orbiting a common purpose. The coming together of Musk and Gibson is not just a collaboration, it is a celestial event. A fusion of technology's relentless dive with the poignant emotion of cinema, crafting a narrative that resonates with our deepest sensibilities. As we delve deeper into this unprecedented alliance, we embark on a journey that promises to redefine the very fabric of artistic expression and technological innovation. Hold tight, for we are about to venture into a story where the boundaries between science, art, and advocacy blur, signaling the dawn of a new era. When we explore the vast realms of technology and cinema, two monumental figures stand tall, casting long shadows over all others, Elon Musk and Mel Gibson. Both in their distinct spheres have crafted legacies that not only echo through the corridors of their industries, but also have helped shape the zeitgeist of our times. Their influences, quite separate until now, have been paramount in molding perceptions and reimagining futures. The very concept of a partnership between these two powerhouses was once deemed the stuff of dreams, a whimsical idea. Today, however, that fantasy has blossomed into reality, forging an alliance that promises to be not just intriguing, but potentially transformative. They now stand shoulder to shoulder, with a union that challenges our expectations, ready to venture into uncharted territories of innovation and expression. The sudden convergence of Musk's technological brilliance with Gibson's cinematic genius has stirred waves of intrigue across the globe. The world watches with bated breath, a mix of anticipation and speculation, as these titans came together. Their coming together beckons a deep exploration into their illustrious past, offering insights into what could possibly emerge from this exciting collaboration. Each has, in his own right, touched the pinnacle of success, but the blend of their expertise and passion might be the game-changer the world never knew it needed. 
Elon Musk, frequently heralded as a visionary par excellence, is more than just a business magnate. He's a catalyst for change in the modern world. His journey, replete with a myriad of achievements, is amplified by an insatiable thirst for innovation, a drive that constantly questions, challenges, and reinvents. As the dynamic force behind Tesla, Musk not only carved out a revolutionary niche, but effectively changed the narrative around sustainable mobility. His genius, however, doesn't stop there. With SpaceX, he reimagined the very concept of space travel, turning the dreamy idea of a multi-planetary civilization into a tangible goal. Neuralink, his foray into the complexities of the human brain, further showcases his relentless pursuit of the unknown, adopting the title Techno-Optimist. Musk is more than just an entrepreneur, he's a dreamer and a doer, a figure who envisions a world where technology acts as the cornerstone for a brighter, more sustainable future, where human existence is augmented by machines and the world as we know it is constantly evolving. In contrast, Mel Gibson, with a career spanning decades in Hollywood, is synonymous with cinematic masterpieces. Yet, it's his unwavering dedication to crafting authentic tales, often eschewing commercial temptations, that truly distinguishes him from his contemporaries. Like Musk, Gibson too is a disruptor, albeit in a different arena. Through films like the gritty Brave Heart or the deeply spiritual The Passion of the Christ, he showcased an ability to delve deep into human emotions, delivering raw and authentic experiences to audiences worldwide. His penchant for taking risks, evident in his decision to use native dialects in movies like Apocalypto, exemplifies a filmmaker who prioritizes genuineness over mass appeal. However, the narrative takes an even more compelling turn with the 2023 release of Sound of Freedom. This cinematic offering doesn't just narrate, it engulfs, delivering a harrowing portrayal of the world of human trafficking. It weaves a dense web of emotions, taking the viewer on a roller coaster of despair, hope, and redemption. But amidst this cinematic experience lies the tantalizing enigma. How do Musk and Gibson, two stalwarts from vastly different worlds, interlink in this saga? Post its dramatic debut, which catalyzed impassioned discussions and faced unexpected hurdles from major streaming platforms, the collaborative nature of their involvement became the focal point of global attention. Their alliance not only promises to challenge conventional entertainment norms, but also to spark dialogues that transcend the screen, infiltrating real-world discussions. Within the ever-evolving tapestry of the cinematic world, there lies a whirlwind of controversy. And at its core stands the enigmatic Mel Gibson. He's not just any actor, director, or producer. Gibson is a titan whose contributions to film have often been groundbreaking and sometimes contentious. Over the decades, this multifaceted figure has built an empire on a foundation of talent and audacity. Beyond his iconic roles and directorial masterpieces, Gibson is the driving force behind the thought-provoking The Sound of Freedom, known not just for his artistry but for his fearless penchant for speaking his mind. He's often been the torchbearer of contentious debates within Hollywood. Reflect upon a riveting video from 1998 where Gibson unabashedly critiqued the industry terming it a labyrinth of moral ambiguity. That diatribe, it seems, was just the beginning. For in today's era, Gibson's convictions appear to have deepened and matured, especially as he dares to spotlight the dark, intricate web of human trafficking. However, to dismiss the controversy involving the sound of freedom as merely the byproduct of typical cinematic dynamics would be an oversimplification. Instead, this maelstrom arises from the stark, unadulterated truths that the film fearlessly lays bare. By meticulously crafting an immersive experience, the film drags its audience, perhaps unwittingly at times, into the harrowing alleys of a global human trafficking nexus. It doesn't just narrate a tale, it unveils a chilling reality, a sinister world that many in positions of power and influence would rather see remain cloaked in shadow. This brutally transparent representation has ruffled many a feather, leading to an unforeseen cold shoulder from influential corridors of the entertainment industry. Streaming giants, once seen as neutral exhibitors, have now seemingly joined the fray, sidestepping the opportunity to showcase this pivotal film. In the expansive cosmos of streaming, where content is king, giants such as Netflix and Amazon Prime rule the roost. Their algorithms dictate viewing patterns, and their decisions can elevate or bury content. Yet with the release of The Sound of Freedom, both giants have taken an unusually reserved stance. 
Such overt caution naturally begets questions. What about the film's narrative spurs such circumspection? It's conceivable to speculate that the unsparing, unfiltered portrayal of the grim underbelly of human trafficking might be too incendiary, too potent for their cultivated brand images. With millions of subscribers and stakeholders to answer to, these platforms, it seems, are cautiously navigating the treacherous waters surrounding a subject that cries out for undistracted global attention. Some believe that the reason for the Sound of Freedom snub from streaming platforms has to do with the fact that the film is based on the experiences of Tim Ballard, who is a known sympathizer of the ridiculous and debunked QAnon conspiracies. This film undoubtedly is the best film I've done since the Passion of the Christ. Amid this complex web of corporate strategy and cinematic advocacy, Gibson, ever the maverick, has metamorphosed into a tireless crusader for his creation. With every interview, every podcast, every press conference, he radiates an intensity, a commitment to shed light on the grim world of human trafficking. This isn't just promotion, it's a mission. While his 1998 critique was a clarion call against the industry's malaise, Today, Gibson channels his energies toward a higher purpose, leveraging the vast reach and influence of cinema to inspire change and awareness. But as if this narrative wasn't already brimming with intrigue, enter Elon Musk, a visionary magnate whose ventures stretch from the roads of Earth to the vastness of space. In a fortuitous turn of events, Musk, even dubbed the real-life Iron Man for his innovative pursuits, has thrown his considerable weight behind the sound of freedom. This serendipitous alliance between two giants from disparate spheres has sent ripples across both the entertainment and tech sectors. Musk's digital endorsement didn't just laud the film, it offered a strategic roadmap for its dissemination. The ensuing dialogues between Musk and the film's distribution team are nothing short of electrifying, suggesting that this collaboration could catalyze a paradigm shift in how such pivotal films find their audience. Yet, lurking beneath these high-profile endorsements and debates is a narrative of unexpected triumph. Against myriad challenges, Sound of Freedom has woven a tale of box office magic. Its sensational debut not only eclipsed esteemed contemporaries, but also set cash registers ringing to the tune of an astonishing $14 million. This success isn't a mere flash in the pan. As the days unfolded, the film continued its meteoric rise, clinching prestigious accolades and outpacing cinematic juggernauts like Disney's Elemental. Its escalating revenue graph bears testimony to its compelling narrative and wide-reaching appeal. While Sound of Freedom stands tall amidst the vast landscape of cinema, it also symbolizes a broader movement within the world of faith-driven films. Historically, films that explore deeper spiritual themes have often been relegated to niche status struggling to find mainstream acceptance. However, Sound of Freedom with its resounding success challenges this convention. Critics may remain divided, but the audience has spoken. With impeccable ratings on trusted platforms like Rotten Tomatoes and CinemaScore, the film's profound connection with viewers is undeniable. Its success, coupled with other faith-centric films, heralds an era where narratives embedded with spiritual depth and existential questions find broad-based resonance and acclaim. As we pull the curtain down on this exhaustive dive into the historic convergence of two formidable figures, Musk and Gibson, it's clear that their collective impact on the realms of technology and cinema has been monumental. This isn't just a movie or a business venture, it's about the cross-pollination of ideas, vision, and conviction. The strength of their alliance promises to create not just cinematic masterpieces, but to illuminate darker corners of our society and perhaps initiate meaningful change. But beyond the glitz of Hollywood and the shimmer of Silicon Valley, we must ask ourselves, what does this alliance symbolize for our world at large? The Sound of Freedom may be a stirring cinematic portrayal, but it echoes the realities faced by countless individuals ensnared in the shadows of human trafficking. It stands as a testament to the power of film, artistry, and genuine advocacy. It's easy to be swayed by big names and dramatic narratives, but the true takeaway here is a call to consciousness and awakening to the realities that so often go unnoticed. This fascinating tale of collaboration, innovation, and advocacy invites a deeper introspection. How often do we confront the uncomfortable truths in our world? Are we merely passive consumers of media or active participants in shaping societal narratives? As you ponder on these musings, I invite you to share your thoughts below. How has the Sound of Freedom or the Alliance of Musk and Gibson influenced or challenged your perceptions? 
Let's ignite a meaningful discourse and foster a community that not only celebrates but also champions change. If you found this deep dive compelling, don't forget to hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel for more insightful content. Join our journey of exploration, critique, and enlightenment. Together, let's navigate the vast universe of art, innovation, and humanity.